Uh, good morning. Um, ushers, would you like to come forward? And uh, Tim forgot to do offering, so um, I'll do it. But uh, <laughs> uh, one thing I want to share, one of the things, good morning, Palisade. It is good to have you with us this morning. And my name's Pastor Bob. And uh, one of the jobs I have is I'm a pastor of, of a couple of our campuses, like Ronnie is at Palisade. I'm a uh, pastor at the... Uh, Kimwood campus and at the Racket Club campus. And uh, last week, uh, we have outgrown at Racket Club the place that we meet. We meet under trees, and in the winter, we get to meet under a shelter. And so, yeah, that's a cool thing. Uh, we've outgrown it. And so I, I've been challenging them to uh, give to build a shelter so we can fit 100 people under there. We typically, it fits about 70 right now, and last year it was really crowded. And so at the end of the service, we handed out the offering, and uh, we give uh, little treats to kids as they listen. We usually have about 20 to 30 kids that come, and uh, we give little treats for listening well, and we give these little snicker bars. And this little boy came up, and he said, I, I don't have anything. Do you think God would want this? Do you think God could use that? And I just said, yeah. I think God can use that. You see, uh, we think what we give really doesn't matter. Because over in the high school building, in the back of the high school building, I have cases and cases and cases of Snickers that God has just given us to us free to give away. And, but this one has a particular value to me. And I think that's the way our offering is to the Lord. He's not short on anything. But when we offer things that don't seem like much, it matters a lot in the kingdom of God. And so um, one of the things that uh, we've been going through, and we started this campaign, and Pastor Kirk, when he came here years ago, he, he had these five dreams for our, for our church. And one would be, we would be a church for adoption. And, and we would adopt 100 kids. Our church would be so crazy to believe that. And, and I think we've gotten really close to that. And the other would be that we would be a church that would rise men up, that ri would rise men up to do mighty things for God. And I see men doing this all the time now. And then, I, I, and then you know, that, um, that we would also be a church that would focus on the next generation. That, this, that, that it can't just be about us but it's gotta be the generation below us. And the last one was that he believed that we could be debt free. And it seemed easier to believe in the others because <laughs> we live in a culture that doesn't believe that this is possible. And so he has stepped into this thing called horizons. What would it look like if we were debt free? What would it look like if we paid down debt and build up people? And so we've started this book and it's called Plastic Donuts, and uh, it's in the bookstore, and it's only $5, and the name seems silly, and the, the, the length of it's very little, and you're like, does it, anything that small and, and, and that silly matter? And I tell you, as I read it, I'm as challenged as Pastor Kirk. When he told me that, I kind of rolled my eyes. I'm like, are you serious? This is the book that we're gonna do as a church. And as I read it, like, wow, this is really difficult. And, um, and so he asked me if I would speak. He asked if I would speak on, it's not the amount, but it's the heart that gives. And he, uh, uh, he asked me, and he handed the, this passage, the main passage. So if you have your Bible, I'm going to ask you to open it. And it's in Deuteronomy, and it's Deuteronomy 16. But before we start, let's just pray. Sometimes I get so excited. It's like, it's like dinner. You're like, hey, let's eat. Like, oh, I forgot to pray. So, uh, <laughs> Father, we just thank you. And uh, God, there was a word that was given that God is raising faith in here this morning. And for those who are low on faith, God, I just speak faith into you. I speak life into you. If you've come here and you're like, I am weary and burdened and heavy, that Jesus is your answer today. And he isn't just today, he's for every day. And those who are 
uh, full of faith, I say, let your cup overflow. Let it spill over into the other areas. But Father, I just pray that your words would come and that your word would come alive today and it would speak to our hearts. And we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. All right, so we are in Deuteronomy 16. So Deuteronomy is uh, the last of the five books that Moses wrote. And, um, and so where we're at is in Deuteronomy 16, 16. And, uh, and I'll just go ahead and read it. And so when I read this, I'm like, Pastor Kirk, are you serious? You want me to read this? He said, yes, read this. I'm like, ugh, okay. So <laughs> says, three times a year, all your men must appear before the Lord, your God, in the place he will choose. At the festival of unleavened bread, the festival of weeks, and the festival of tabernacles. And that would have been great if it would have stopped right there. So that's good. God's calling us. He wants to meet with us. And then it says, no one should appear before the Lord empty-handed. And I'm like... Kirk, or Pastor Kirk, I always call him Pastor Kirk. I'm like, you know how many pastors have used this to manipulate people? And, and, and I've, heard, I've watched enough TV and, and stuff, and I've heard this, and I'm like, this, ugh. And so if you're just visiting today, this message is for us. And I, I just hope that God has a word for you too today, because The word of God is perfect for correcting, training, and rebuking. Amen? And he said, each of you must bring a gift in proportion to the way the Lord has blessed you. And I want you, if you have your Bible, I want you to circle proportion. Because just taking that text by itself out of context loses what God is really saying. And I, as, I, as I go through discipleship and I train young, young men and men, is one of the things I tell them always is read 20 verses before and 20 verses after. And you will get a context of what's going on. And so what, what he's talking about, these three festivals. Um, in the Old Testament, God commanded giving. And he commanded eight types of giving. Four of them were commanded by law, like the tithe, or if you sinned, if you did this sin, then you must do this. But four out of the eight was a free will gift. It didn't matter what you brought. He just determined in your heart what you're supposed to bring out of the generosity of how God has blessed you. See, I, I, this is one of my pet peeves. Um, when we get invited to go to a potluck or something, I love those, as you can tell. Um, is that when, what's the first question when you get invited is, what should I bring, right? And the, I love when they just say, can you bring a salad that would feed 20 people? I love that because I know exactly what I'm supposed to bring. What I hate <laughs> is bring, yeah, my wife's laughing like, you do any of this. <laughs> I hate because my wife asked me these questions. <laughs> and she says, did you ask him this? Like, no. Did you ask him? No. <laughs> like, I barely got where, when it is and where it is. All right. And so then they, they but they say that anything, it doesn't matter, just bring something. And so we got invited to go to a potluck, which I didn't know that was a Chinese potluck. <laughs> and we brought a Mexican dish. <laughs> And so it stood out very clear <laughs> that I wasn't listening very well. So, so God had laid out three times a year that all the men, women, and children needed to come to Jerusalem. And he said these three feasts. And these three feasts are really important because they point to Jesus. The first one is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And this is what we would call Passover. And this is the story of Moses in Exodus. And this is after nine plagues. And God had protected the Jewish people all through these plagues. But on the 10th one, the Jewish people had to step into faith. And on this night, God said that death will pass you and your house by one way and one way only. 
Death will pass you and your house one way and one way only. And I know in today's modern context, we don't like one way, one way only, but that's how God works. He said, you must take a lamb, an unblemished lamb, and offer it as a sacrifice to me. And you must take its blood, and you must take a, a bush and dip the blood, or dip the bush into the blood and paint it over the doorpost. And when the death angel comes, it will see that your house is covered by the blood of the lamb. And it will pass, and you will live. If I do not see the blood of the lamb, you will not live. And he says, every year to you, people of the Jewish faith, you must come to Jerusalem and remember the blood of the lamb. You must remember how I told you to cleanse your house of all leaven, which is sin. <laughs> and we see the picture of Jesus in this. And he says, once a year, I want you to remember this. And the second one was called, the, the and, and, and it's through the cross, amen? It is through the cross. It is the picture of the cross. The unblemished lamb is Jesus. And when we have him painted over our doorposts, our life, we live. Our name is written in the book of life. There is no other way to heaven than through the blood of Jesus, amen? And so when he says, I want you to come and remember this, he's not saying to uh, the Jewish people just once a year, but he's saying to us, always remember the precious blood of Jesus. There is no other redemption than other through the blood of Jesus, amen. All right, we're building faith, amen? All right, so thank you. <laughs> and so the second one is the Feast of Weeks. And the Feast of Weeks is a, a celebration of how God has blessed you and your work. How God has blessed you and your family. How God wants to be involved, not just on the Sabbath, which was a Saturday and for us is a Sunday, but he wants to be involved in every aspect of your life. And, and once a year, he says, come to me and we're gonna have a party to celebrate what God is doing in your work, what God is doing in your family, what God is doing in your friends, and we're gonna party. And we call that Pentecost, which is the birth of the church. And when they would come together, they would celebrate how God has blessed them. And he says, I just want you to come to me and, and, and I'm inviting you to a big potluck. Just don't come empty-handed and give to proportion which God has given you. And then finally, and this is, I mean, it's hard to say which one of my favorite is, but I particularly like this one because right now, um, this started on October 8th. It is called the, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. And what this was is God wanted his people to remember that while they were in the wilderness for 40 years, he lived in a tent with them. And so once a year for a week, you and your family would take a tent and you'd go outside of your house or go on your roof and you would live in that tent. And it's to get away from all the noise of this world. And in this tent, it didn't have a roof because it doesn't rain very much in Israel. And what this meant was is that God dwells with us. That God dwells with us always. And it's a promise of the coming of Jesus that he would once dwell with us, Emmanuel, God among us. And it's also the promise of the second coming of Jesus that we would dwell with him forever. And then the open tent at night meant that we have an open heaven. John 1 says that you will walk under an open heaven and you will see even greater things. And so this picture is when we realize what God has done for us, what he has done for the cross, and what he has done in our lives and blessed us, and what he has done in his presence that no long, he says, 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, do you not realize, church, do you not realize, church, that you are, the Holy Spirit lives and you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? That he lives in us. And then he says, I want you to come to me. And so when I read that, I'm like, yes, of course. If someone gave me a great gift, I would be so excited. And they invited me to their house, I wouldn't want to come empty-handed. Don't you hate going to a potluck empty-handed? 
And so this is not meant to manipulate or anything like this, but once you learn about when God says that, that there are these free will gifts, and it's out of because of my love for you, Lord, what you've done in my life and how you've rescued me, amen? And so a year ago, almost to the date, I was in uh, Africa. And so it really was kind of like a uh, Ernest goes to Africa kind of thing. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, I'm just a fruit of kid. Like, I, I felt like the Beverly Hillbillies. And, um, and, and when I was in Africa, I was there for two weeks, and I got to go with Pastor Nate, and, and um, that was an adventure. And, but when I was in there, I saw God do so many crazy things. I... I I saw a lady whose eyes were completely covered with white, God healed right in front of me. I, I, I saw a man whose knee couldn't work and he'd been shot in the war, couldn't walk, and he got up and started dancing. One of my favorite stories when I was in Africa was this young girl, um, she was 14 years old and she uh, had never spoke a word in her life. She could hear and she could understand, but she couldn't speak. And, uh, and this young pastor was with me, and, and I said, I think God wants to heal her. Now, did I hear from the Lord that God wanted to heal her? Like, no, I just know that's the nature of God, that he wants to heal. And he's like, you think so? And I said, yeah, I think so, with all the confidence I could muster. And so he is a particular He's a pastor from a particular don denomination. They like to yell. And so, um, <laughs> it was so funny. Because <laughs> he is praying, and we have no interpreter. They don't speak English. He's praying in English. And he's praying over her. And the mom is with her. And she's there at the medical clinic because she has a distended stomach. And they're, oh, they're almost everywhere because it's bad water. Everything is bad water. Um, and she has this distended stomach. She has diarrhea, achy joints. And she's, you know, sick. And so that's why she came to the clinic. But on her notes said she has not spoken ever. And, and when, when I read that, I said to Joel, I said, I think God wants to heal her. And so he starts praying. He says, in the name of Jesus, because you have to say it like that. In the name of Jesus, I command you to speak. I break off the spirit off you. You will speak. And she's just looking at him because he's yelling and she doesn't understand a word of English. And she looks afraid and the mom's looking at me like, I don't know what he's doing. And, um, and he, goes, he goes, you will say Jesus is Lord. Say it, Jesus is Lord. And she looks at him and says, Jesus is Lord. <laughs> she starts grabbing her tongue because her tongue has never moved or worked. The mom collapses and falls because she had never heard her daughter speak. They get up and they start speaking and hugging and he looks at me and he goes, it worked. And I, I am trying everything in me to say, yeah, I knew it would. <laughs> and then we, we got to go to South Sudan. And in South Sudan, um, it's been in war for 23 years, and it has been devastated. There is no electricity other than by generator. There is no clean water other than water that's drugged from the Nile, which is polluted, and they drink, and they bathe, and they, they go to the bathroom in it, and they throw all the pollutants, and that's what you drink. And it has been a worn, torn area. And we went to a small village, um, uh, Pastor Martin's village, and um, and we were invited to do this training for our South Sudan pastors. And I want you to take a look at this picture. And um, this is the church. It's about a thousand square feet, and um, it has bricks and it has a roof. But it's really not that impressive. It has no windows. It has no doors. And at the end of the time of teaching, this is us doing the training. But on Sunday, I was asked to teach at their church. 
And there were so many people in the church that nobody, not everybody could fit in and they were looking through the windows or where the window should be. And they were so hungry for the presence of God that church started at eight and didn't end until noon. Don't worry, I won't do that to you. Um, and, uh, and at the end of the service, I was just like, wow, this is amazing what God has done. And then Pastor Martin started going, and could you put the picture back up? And Pastor Martin started going and he says, do you see these bricks? He said, when we started this church, um, all, we, it was just a couple widows and a few men and we met under a tree and we met under a tree for, for a year and we had to endure the cold and the rain and the heat. And he says, then the Lord told me that we're supposed to build a building. And, and, and yet, he's talking to widows who have nothing. There is no jobs. The only thing that you can do is make things and hopefully sell them. Make a few bread, make a few this, make a meal and sell it. And he's speaking to widows and children. And, and, and can you go to the next slide? And he says to them, what you have is dirt. And in their houses, all they have is dirt floors, all the roads are dirt, everything is dirt. And he challenged them. He says, I know you don't have a lot, but what you have, God has given you. Praise God. And he says, I want you to go home and determine in your heart what dirt you have. And he says, let's start making bricks. Let's start making bricks out of the dirt that God has given us. And so each of the women and the men went home after that Sunday never making bricks before and having a little bit of water and a little bit of fire and a little bit of dirt and a mold, they started baking bricks. Can you go back to the picture to show the walls? If you could see these bricks, they're not very good bricks. They're kind of like the snicker bar. Not that impressive to a person who builds. But when he started telling me how these women would bring their bricks every week, and some women would bring two bricks, some would bring 10, some would work on it, and other people started gathering more people, and then they brick upon brick upon brick upon brick, and they got to the, the final and they built it all four walls, no, no doors, no windows, no roof, no floor, just dirt with a little heat and a little water made something. And so they had their first church service with no roof and no floor. And they were in there and it's the heat of the, um, which would be our January, it, it's, that's their heart, heat time. They meet in there for four hours and you know what? four brick walls are with the sun beating on it is? It's an oven. <laughs> and these poor widows and these men are just wilting in there and they're singing how great is our God. And the pastor goes home that night and he lives in a hut and their huts are all made out of grass because they have eight foot grass that grows there. And they, it's all made out of grass and then it has a grass uh, roof on it. And in, in South Sudan, you know you made it when you get a metal roof. And him and his wife would dream about having a metal roof on their house. They've been dreaming about it forever because they have a child and when it rains, it just leaks. But Pastor Martin said, I will not put a metal roof on my house until you have a roof on your house. I will not. And he began to fast and pray on Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, set, all the way through Saturday. And on that Sunday, they meet again. And when he was done with church service, he gets a phone call. This is the weirdest thing about South Sudan. Everybody has cell phones, yet they have no power. The Chinese government gives everybody cell phones. And so when they come to church, they have a generator to run their sound system. Everybody plugs their cell phone in and it's supposed to last him all week. And so uh, he gets a phone call from a man he's never met before and from a city he rarely has been to, and he said, the Lord woke me up last night. Listen, church. We can do what we can with bricks, 
but we need the supernatural of God to work. And this campaign isn't about building buildings. It's about paying down debt, building up people, and watching what God can do through ordinary people. And so he gets this call, and he said, the Lord woke me up last night and told me you need a roof. He never met this man. And a metal roof over there is about $5,000. $5,000 to him is like $3 million to us. And by that next Sunday service, God's house had a roof. No longer was Pastor Martin talking about the bricks, he's talking about the roof. Because we talk about Jesus. We do not preach ourselves, but we preach Christ Jesus, amen? And so he, he, he's telling me about the roof. And he said, then we had our first service under the roof. The sun wasn't baking us, and we could not stop singing. We could not stop dancing. We didn't have no preaching. We just praised God. How great is our God? And when they dance, they dance. I, they, I mean, I'm not going to dance for you, but they do dance. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's so funny when you're preaching, because uh, if they like what you say, they just stop. They'll just stop you, and they start praising God. If I talk about the goodness of God, someone will stand up, amen, and they'll start telling you about how good God is, and they'll start singing it, and they'll just go, <laughs> and everybody else will just start clapping, and then, they, then they'll point to another person, and I'm just looking at Pastor Martin like, is that normal? And he says, yes. I'm like, wow, that's weird. Okay. <laughs> it's like, that would be really cool. If anybody wants to stand up and praise God, that would be really cool. All right, so... They have the roof, and they're dancing so much, but the floor's dirt. The floor's dirt. And, and so now dust is filling the whole place. Dust is filling out, out the windows, out onto the street. Listen, when we praise God, when we praise God, it should overflow not just in this building, but into the streets. And so as they're praying, because this has been worn torn, and so the only vehicles they really have around there are little motorcycles and UN trucks. And they're UN trucks going around because they just got off a of war and they're back in war again. And this UN truck drove exactly by when all this dust was filling the streets. This UN worker gets out, and she's from England, and she says, what's going on? And she listens to the service, and she just weeps. And, 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 and she grabs Pastor Martin and says, why are you guys so full of joy when there's so much war and destruction? Church, listen. If you get nothing out of this, get this. Our joy and happiness are not determined by our circumstances. Our joy and happiness are determined by him who lives in us and who set us free and brought us from death to life. And when we know that, we can't help but sing joy and praises to our God. These, these ladies are still widows. These men are still victims of war. There is still not a lot of food. But they can't stop praising their God. And she says, you have a dirt floor. And he says, but we have a roof. <laughs> <laughs> He says, but you have a dirt floor, but we have walls. And then she says, I want to put a floor in for you. I want you to take a look at this next picture. Uh, so that's, that's Pastor Martin. I want you to go to the little kid that's uh, looking through the door. By the next Sunday, <laughs> the UN came in and put a cement floor in. Because a pastor wasn't ashamed to challenge people. Because a pastor just didn't look at widows and say, oh, you're not this and not that. He says, what could this be? And so when they met, they were about 12 people. Last Sunday, they had over 300 people in their church service. <laughs> what Pastor Kirk is talking about isn't because we're not building walls, we're building a kingdom. 
I've been in this church for 20 years, and I've been part of two different campaigns, Caring Enough to Grow in the 90s and Caring Enough to Grow Again in early 2000 when we built on the high school and built the chapel and built these offices here. But nothing excites me more than what we're building now. Because if we're seeing nations change, from this little church of 12, now Pastor Martin oversees 52 churches. Pastor Martin has seen over 52,000 people give their life to Jesus from a few widows who said, all I got is dirt. I got a little bit of dirty water and I have some fire and some time. And in that, we see a nation begin to change. Amen? And so, what I love is that not just widows exist in South Sudan. That we have widows here today. We have people here right now who are struggling and going through hard times. Um, one of my, it's hard to say this, one of my favorite people, because I love all of you, and, and being in the church for 20 years, I've got to serve with lots of people in different ministries, and, but one of the, um, this lady, um, Pastor Kirk asked her to uh, give her testimony and I've, I've known, her name's Betty. And I've known Betty, and she asked me to read it. And so I hope that's okay. But I've known Betty before um, I ever was on staff here, which I've been on staff for over 11 years. I used to be a pharmaceutical rep, and Betty worked at one of the medical offices I used to call on, and she was so kind to me all the time. And I always really enjoyed her. And so here's, here's her testimony. It says, Pastor Bob is reading my testimony because I recently received a diagnosis referred as minimal cognitive impairment. In speaking, I lose words in mid-sentence and I cannot recall them. And I talked to her last week. She said that was the hardest thing to write. As some of us have received a, a diagnosis that's just overwhelming. And it doesn't really come real until you start writing it down and telling people. And then she goes on to say, I was brought up in the church that talked about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I never heard the minister mention that we were supposed to have a personal relationship with Jesus. When I left for college, I turned away from the church. After graduating college, I, mar I got married and had two sons. And 18 years later, I was divorced. A single mom, raising two boys, without any help. A couple years later, I, I met and married the love of my life, Jerry. See, I, one of the things that being here in the church so long, you get to serve with people for a long time. And you get to see births and you get to see baptisms. But you also get to do funerals. And Jerry, uh, when we started the backpack program uh, six years ago, he was one of the first people and he was there every Monday, every Tuesday. And it was his passion. And him and Betty served together. And he was diagnosed with Parkinson's and uh, passed away in 2011. Sorry. Just... And he and his son was raising. He was working out of town because of the economy. And the economy started to rebound in Grand Junction. And Jerry and I were able to work in town. And we began to search for a church home. We are looking for a church where the message came from the scripture. One of my bosses asked if we should try the vineyard. The first time we came, we felt like we were finally in a church home. And the rest is history. We began to connect in the church. We joined a small group, small group taught Crown Financial in our home and making a commitment to help fund, she was there part of the Caring Enough to Grow Again, the chapel building, and serving with God took us. She goes, I gave my life to Jesus in 2001. 
and I was baptized in 2002, and I was there. Jesus, just knowing you, so she's, she's writing this to the church, and then she stops and says, Jesus, just knowing you are with me makes every, wor- every moment in my life meaningful. Jerry went to be with Jesus in 2011. She goes, without God, faith, and the church, and my small group, I don't know what I would have done. She goes, I would recommend everyone here take Pathway to Freedom class. It really makes you look at your life and helps you get rid of the baggage that we carry around with us. When Pastor Kirk announced plans for the Horizon campaign, I decided to attend the introduction meeting. After the meetings, I knew the Lord wanted me to be involved, and I volunteered to help support the team, which uh, has been working behind the scenes. Additionally, I've been reviewing my financials and paying and praying about what the Lord wants me to give. I want the Horizon campaign to be successful and know that the Lord will bless the church body for the commitments they make to it. In God I trust, I will not be afraid. Thank you, Betty. I hope I did okay with that. So, this is the part of the service I really hate. Because it's really cool to tell stories about a girl who can speak, and it's really cool to tell stories about how God's working in a church in a faraway land. But I... I have to tell stories about me. And as God was working in my life 19 years ago, thinking that I had it all right and all built and I had these bricks and I was building a life of success with my own bricks, with my own effort, with my own degree, with my own things, God started showing me about, you don't have bricks, Bob. All you have is dirt. And someone invited me to church. And I did not want to go to church because I had a career. I had a title I wanted. I had money I wanted to make. But they invited me, and I went begrudgingly. (laughs) And my wife loved it, and so I had to go again. (laughs) And she loved it more, and so she invited her her mother, and she went, and we started going. And I never really saw this because I was working on my own bricks, building my own house, laying my own foundation. And the Lord just kept on talking, no, you're just dirt. You're just dirt. And um, this is what I would do. Last week, Pastor Kirk talked about, it's kind of like show and tell, right? Pastor Kirk talked about Gracie giving a wallet to, to Kirk Pastor Kirk, and, uh, and how it pleased him so much. But as I was going to church my first year and a half, I would take my wallet, and this is no lie, and I'm not proud of this. I'd take my wallet, and before I'd go to church, I would lay this on my bricks at home. So when I came to church, there was nothing to give because I wasn't going to allow any pastor man to manipulate me to give. And and when I did accidentally forget to take a 20 out, and it would pass by and I felt obligated, when I went home, I regretted it. Yet God kept blessing this dirt. And he kept feeding this dirt. And he started planting seeds in this dirt, and something started to grow. And it took me a year before anything ever started to sprout, but one day a pastor said, you might know about God, you might know about Jesus, but does Jesus know you? And I said, I don't think so. And he says, if you don't know, then ask, do you know me, Jesus? And the moment I said that, the warmth of the Holy Spirit, I became a tabernacle. And he started to fill me. 
And even though he filled me and I said yes to Jesus and I got baptized every Sunday, I would lay my money on the bricks that I was building. And God has a great sense of humor. He kept blessing me in my job, despite my selfishness. And in my job, I got a check, bonus check, for $5,000. Guess what the message was that Sunday on preaching? (laughs) I mean, 52 weeks a year. I could have got that bonus check any other time. It was on tithing, about giving to God. And I remember looking at my wife, and I'm like, no. <laughs> no. I know I grew up in Fruita, but I can do math. That's $500. I am not giving $500. No. And we got in the car, and she's just looking at me like, no. I she didn't even say anything. And I just said, I'm just going for a bike ride. And I got on my bike, and I started riding up the monument, and and you ever just start talking to yourself? You don't realize you're really talking to God? Like, I ain't gonna do that. That's just crazy. Like, you know, those, they don't need that. I, I see what he drives. And blah, blah, blah. You know, you just start like rationalizing. Like, I look like I need it more than him. You know, I got three kids, or I got two kids at this time. And, and I'm paddling. And I'm paddling. And the Lord just speaks. Because he took this dirt, because I put faith and I put the blood over the door. And then he filled his tabernacle. And then all of a sudden, I had an open heaven. I couldn't understand it. Nobody had taught me about this. But under that night, uh, uh, right before the tunnel, going up on the junction side, I'm sitting there complaining about $500. And God said, trust me. And I went home, and I said begrudgingly, write the check. And we put the check in the next, the next week. And, and God just started opening up opportunities. I, don't, I hate to tell the story because it sounds like a prosperity, and I don't mean it to be that way. But God did not just give me a new job after that. God stopped me from idolizing this. And he just started taking these bricks that I once thought were so important, my career, my my family, my title, and he just started breaking them, and he says, I want you to start building on the foundation that I have laid. 1 Corinthians 3, uh, 11 says that no one can build upon the foundation of Christ Jesus. And when I started building bricks on that, then the word of God started growing, and things started growing out of this dirt. And he started putting a pastor's heart on me, and I started serving, and I started... And this didn't seem to be so important anymore. And I, I, I want you to get this, is that Paul writes about this, and I know I'm killing you, Anthony, with my slide selection, because I've been jumping all over. But he says in 2 Corinthians 9, and he talks about how he, wa- he, he wants a joyful giver. And he says this. He says, each one of you, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. He says, each one must do just as he is purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I want to invite the worship team up. He said, if you came here and and you thought that this was a way to manipulate you and get rid of your bricks and that's not the purpose at all. God is doing amazing things in this house, not just in South Sudan. God is building foundations in this house. And and it says in Luke 5, do not build your house on sand, but build it on the rock. And he's building, I have seen through CR, I have seen people who have walked away from a life of drugs and alcohol, that they've built their life on Jesus. I have seen marriages through marriage ministry here that have had affairs, and God has healed it and restored it, and they're doing ministry again. I have seen a lady right here in a wheelchair get up and walk. God is putting a roof on this house. God is doing the super, amen. 
God is doing the supernatural here. He's laying foundations, he's building roofs. Just last Wednesday, sorry Tim, just last Wednesday, we were at a service and, uh, and had a word of knowledge that God wanted to heal a hearing. And, and no one even prayed. There's a guy, I don't know if you're here, Joseph, there's a guy who uh, had, was in the war and had lost all his hearing in his right ear. And this guy hears this word of knowledge that God wants to heal hearing. No one prayed for him. As the service was going on, God can restore his hearing. And he can hear. And he gets up and he starts telling people, I can hear, I can hear, I can hear. God is doing the supernatural in our roofs here. Amen. He's just asking us, what are you doing with the dirt? And if you want us just, like Betty, to start serving and helping, you know, we have awesome opportunities through backpacks and we have great signups and we're doing stuff all over the place. And you're saying, I, I'm willing to start doing that. Just come to the front desk. But as we stand, I just want us to stand and worship in this last song. And maybe we would sing so loud that dust would fall into the streets, amen? Maybe we would sing so loud that somebody would be driving by and say, what's going on in this church? Because when, when Joseph's ear got here, he can't quit telling people about what's going on in this church because it's Jesus, the foundation, that is doing it all. And we give him all the glory. So stand up and sing to our mighty king, amen? Amen.